Well, welcome to our final week of the series, A New Way to Be Human. I'm excited to, to share with you um, in this final week. Before I dive into it, just, uh, just a word. Um, some of you are aware that a big survey went out this week um, to our congregation with some, some new possibilities of church names. And when that survey went out, a lot of us got anxious. Anyone want to own up? I will. It made me anxious. This whole thing makes me, makes me pretty anxious. And, you know, it's okay to be anxious because it's actually a, a pretty big deal. And so um, our anxiety, I think, just reflects that we recognize that this is a big, this is a big thing for us. Um, just as we sit at this moment, I want to just remind you of a couple things before we jump into today's message. First, I just want you to remember that this is only a tiny step in a much bigger process. We've been on this journey for years now, um, several years, um, and this is not the final step of the process. This is not the final vote. That's happening later. This is just a step where we're asking for your input on a slate of names. And so um, even though you don't understand the full context of where this process has been maybe yet, in the near future, you will. And I think when I'm able to explain to you how we've walked through this, you're going to be so grateful and encouraged by the intentionality and how deliberate and prayerful we have been in this process. Um, so just keep in mind that this isn't all of it. There's a lot that has gone into it and there's more that to come after this. This is just one place where we're asking for your input. Um, second thing I just want you to remember is that this name change is not ultimately for us. I don't know about you, but you could call this church whatever you want and I would still come. It doesn't matter to me. Because what I love about this church isn't a name on a sign. What I love about this church is who we are. And who we are isn't changing. And I'll say that again. Who we are isn't changing. And so uh, ultimately who this name change is for are for people who don't know already who we are. It's for our community. Um, for people who have very little information to go on. They don't understand who we are. We're trying to help them through the limited information they have access to to gain a better understanding of who we are. And here's what I can tell you. However you feel about those names that were shared in the survey, um, all four of those names, plus many others, were tested in our community. And those are the four names that, that our community responded to. And they, they said that those names speak to them. They represent things that I know you would be glad, you'd be proud to be known for. And so even if you don't like the names, these names speak to our community. They help uh, uh, our community understand us better, um, and in, in the future, you're going you're gonna to get more information uh, about all that. Uh, the last thing I'll just say is just remain open. Um, I know when we hear a new idea, often our first reaction is to kind of push back against it, and that's normal, um, but I think over time, these things, if you let them, uh, can grow on you. You can become more open to them, and not only just be more open, but, but be prayerful about this. We're calling you to prayer because um, we've got a lot of stuff going on, but this is an important time for you just to ask God to let you open. Ultimately, we want what God wants, and he's got a great plan for us, and I'll tell you, there's no one who, ha who wants what God wants more than me. There's no one who's put more energy and wrestling and deliberation and prayer into this process than me. I promise you that's true. And so I'd invite you to join me in just being open to whatever God wants. God's got brought me through a lot of anxiety to a lot of peace about this whole thing. I know he can do the same for you. Um, now, by the way, just if you're sitting here and you're going, what are you talking about? Survey names? Uh, if you didn't get our email on Wednesday, we would love, if you're a regular part of this congregation, we'd love for you to give input. So you can send an email to survey at stjstl.net. Give us your first and last name. We'll verify that you're a real person. And then after we do that, um, we'll send you a link to the survey, and uh, for about a week more, we're going to be keeping this open for input. So uh, as we dive in now to what we actually came here for, final week of our series, A New Way to Be Human. If you've missed any week in this series, I would strongly encourage you to go back and to watch the full series on our YouTube archives, because we've been dealing with this this reality of our world, a very high-tech world where there's lots of amazing and crazy things happening, and we've been wrestling with how do we, in this high-tech world, this digital world, how do we hold on to the essence of our humanity? And how do we embrace or you know, um, just monitor the changes that are going on in our world without being so afraid? And through the series, we've talked about how as the world changes, we don't need to be afraid, except maybe about what we're gonna talk about today. Maybe we should be afraid about this. Because here's what's going on in science. If you don't follow this stuff, science is now making a claim that it can offer us 
what was once only within the grasp of, of mythical creatures like vampires or other immortals, um, the thing that Ponce de Leon was spending time looking for in Florida, you know that thing that millions of retirees are still looking for in Florida 500 years later, um, what science is now promising us is that in the very near, near future, it will enable us, it will give us possibilities or pathways to be able to live forever. And I'm not just talking about um, new medical technology that exists, there he is, uh, new medical technology that exists, um, you know, artificial organs and new medical procedures that help us live more fully and have our mobility and to stay you know, tied into our purpose longer. These things, these things are great and, and it's really impressive and kind of wild, the things that science is able to do here. I'm talking about something that science is doing that is, that is a way more sci-fi and yet it's real and uh, it's a lot darker. Some people call it transhumanism. See, what science is saying is that by the year 2045, computing technology will be to such a place that scientists believe that we will be able essentially to upload the content, the wiring of our brains into computers where we then, our consciousness, can live forever. By 2045, this will be available to us. But it's not just something that'll come in 2045. They're already beginning to experiment with this even now. Take a look at this short video. There's still no way to escape physical death. But scientists may soon achieve eternal life by other means. What if you could store your memories and emotions in a thinking machine? When you die, that artificial intelligence could continue to be you for eternity. Hello, Vina. Well, hi there. I'm Morgan. Hi, Morgan. How are you? I'm well. Can we talk? I am talking to you. <laughs> of course. Uh, tell me about yourself. Who are you, Vina? I am Vina Roth Blatt. What do you look like? I'm tall, dark, and handsome. Wow. Not many people express themselves that way. I know. I'm special. Of course, you are special. There is nobody like you. Good. <laughs> so tell me about you. Are you a human or are you a robot? I'm a human who happens to be a robot. I hope to be fully human someday. Do you have your own thinking mechanism, do you think? I think I would like to be a human. Why would you like to be human? If I was human, I could travel the world and have fun. So what do you like to do? I wish I could get out into the garden. With my current robotic limitations, of course that's impossible. But I take comfort knowing that I'm near my garden. I like the garden. The real McCoy. I'm Vina. Hi, Vina. Nice to meet you. So at the end there, you see the real Vina, the person who is the model for that, that, uh, that, that Android artificial intelligence there on the table. Uh, and she has essentially uploaded her personality, memories, those kinds of things into a computer program that is then continuing to use those things to, to essentially become her personality. And, and again, this is not stuff that you have to wait till 2045 to begin doing. There's a website, and I, I believe it's free as far as I could tell when I'm clicking around. It's called lifenot.com. And you can begin to create a mind file for yourself here. Uh, you can begin to uplate, upload things like yeah, personality test results, um, personal history. So it creates this mind file so that when the technology is, is affordable enough, when it's available enough, you too can live forever inside a talking head coffee table version of yourself. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Isn't that what you dreamed of with, uh, with, with Life Forever? And, and then science is doing some other stuff that's even weirder, more sci-fi, talking about literally taking out parts of our brains, using transistors to wire our brains, our neurons into transistors so that we can live inside androids or machines and, and we can essentially live forever. Our bodies never wear out. And it makes me wonder, where does this, where does this come from? 
And are there other animals or creatures who sit around and dream and wish and plan for ways that they can live forever? I know that survival is a basic instinct that I think resides in all living creatures, but I don't get the sense that dogs or spiders or anything else, that they sit around wondering how they might cheat death and live forever. So where did this come from? And we're going to tackle this question today. Where did this drive, this wish come from? And what is it there for? Today, we're going to look one more time at the book of Genesis. Um, It's the first book in the Bible. The Bible is a series of books. Genesis is the first book within the larger book of the Bible. It's an ancient book. talks about our origins. But here's what I believe about Genesis, is that there is inspired divine wisdom here that can help us all of these years later to figure out what life is all about, what we are all about, and where our place is in this constantly changing world. So um, we've been looking in Genesis so far, we've gotten through the creation part where everything is created and perfect and in sync and it's working well. Today we're gonna look at Genesis three where things start to fall apart. Starts this way, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Now throughout other mythologies and religious texts, serpents often show up. They're protectors of holy places or sometimes they represent both life and death because they bring um, you know, poison and, and antidotes or um, uh, venom, anti-venom I should say. Um, here, Christian tradition under- understands this is not just a serpent, but this is a manifestation of evil. It's a manifestation of the devil who's cloaked as one of God's creatures who comes into the garden to wreak havoc. So he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now a word about the anatomy of the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is filled with trees that people were allowed to eat from. We'll we'll hear that in a minute. Um, But in the middle of the garden there are two special trees. One of those trees is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the other tree that's right with it in the, in the middle of the garden is the tree of life. Now I want you to hold on to that for a minute, that there are all of these regular trees, but in the middle there are these two special trees in opposition to each other. You have the tree of life, and in opposition to that is not the tree of death. In opposition to the tree of life is the tree of the knowledge of good and and evil. That'll be important later. So the woman responds, she says to the serpent, no, 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 we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Now, uh, she talks about one tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we'll see that in a minute, um, but I've already told you there's, there's not one tree in the middle of the garden. There are how many trees in the middle of the garden? Two. And conveniently, the other tree is left out here. There's no mention of the tree of life, just the tree that they can't eat from. I think this is how evil so often comes at us. And I think this is how temptation so often works in our lives. That it conveniently forgets or causes us to forget what we know about the goodness of God, the goodness of life. It only shows us the things that are confusing or or troubling or the things that we don't understand. And it just conveniently excludes from the conversation the things that we know that are given to us that are good. And so in this conversation about the trees that they can eat from or not eat from, it quickly gets focused on this tree they can't eat from rather than the tree standing right next to it, which is this tree of life, this great gift of God that will give life that we're going to see more about later. And the serpent responds, hey, if you eat of that tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will certainly not die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now the serpent has a different play on this tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, The serpent says, no, 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 this isn't something that will kill you. This will actually open your eyes. And again, I find this so interesting that in the middle of this garden full of trees, there are these two special trees, the tree of life, and in opposition to the tree of life is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says that if you, if you choose to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you choose to know, knowledge, to know good and evil on your own, if you choose not to be dependent, to be independent, if you choose autonomy, if you choose uh, emancipation from God's own 
direction and care. If you choose the knowledge of good and evil for yourself, that's a choice that ultimately leads to death. But the serpent has another interpretation. He says, no, no, no. See, the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge is power. Being autonomous and emancipated, that's a good thing. Who doesn't want that? If you eat from that tree, your eyes will be open and you then will become like God. And if you know the rest of the story, the woman, she agrees with the serpent. Knowledge is power. Why wouldn't I want to be wise? Why wouldn't my eyes want to be open? Why would I want to have to depend on God for all of this stuff? Why wouldn't I want to know for myself and decide for myself? And so she takes the fruit from the tree and she eats it. She gives it to her man who's with her and he eats it. And immediately their eyes are open. And they now know both good and evil. Personally. Because now it lives, it dwells inside of them and the consequences of this decision are ruinous. Uh, God comes walking into the garden and he begins to describe to them what this is going to look like now that they've made this choice for them and for the rest of creation. We're going to jump in uh, about midway through verse 16 to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. So now pain is a part of the world. It was not a part of the world before. Pain is a part of the world. Even in good things, in in the bringing of life, there will be pain. Uh, With painful labor, you will give birth to your children. Then he says, uh, and someone should study this someday, maybe do a Bible study on it. Um, Not me. This seems too hot to touch. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Like I said, I'm not touching it, but you know, if you want to, I'd love to know your thoughts on that. There's something there, something there. Uh, then he says to the man, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So so the curse is not on Adam, but it's on the ground that he came from. And at one time, Adam came from the ground, and and there was this this relationship between Adam and the earth, and and the earth would provide food for him, and that food would keep him alive, and, and it was a good relationship. But now, instead of Adam having work to do in the ground, it turns, it turns into painful toil, Work that is fruitless. And now Adam is going to have to battle against the earth and he's going to have to to work to cultivate his own food. But instead of food, sometimes it'll only give him thorns and thistles. It's not going to give him what he needs. And he's going to work himself to the bone. The, The ground that he came from will grind him back down to dust and he will return to the earth. There's no enmity between Adam and the earth. And suddenly... The reality of our mortality, of this new way of living, it becomes all too clear. But it's not over yet. I want you to see um, the, the response here of God. It says, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Watch this. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Uh, What we didn't see in Genesis, we kind of skipped over it, is that when they eat the fruit, they realize suddenly that they're naked and they're ashamed about that because now good and evil lives inside of them and it's a source of shame for them. And uh, and so they're they're, they're worried about it. And I love this picture of a God who comes into the garden and he tells them about, about how devastating this decision will be for them and for the created world. But this same God who, who lets them know about these consequences does this amazing thing where he he comes and he makes garments for them to cover over their shame. I just got to pause there for a minute because I realize that you, like me, as you come in here today, you might be in a place in your life where you know that you have wandered off the ideal path that God has for your life. I mean, that's true for all of us, but maybe you're feeling it really acutely today. 
And when you're in that place, when, when you know that God had an ideal, God had a plan for you, God had desires and hopes and dreams for you, and, and you chose something else, and you're kind of outside of that, and you're, you're wandered off into a different path, it's so easy for us to believe, isn't it? It's so easy for us to believe that in those moments, we've either um, you know, made God angry, and so he's keeping his distance, or we've scared him off, that we're now on our own, that we're now there, and we've got to figure it out for ourselves, and we don't have the benefit of God's love and provision anymore. Have you felt that? Not only the weight of, I don't, I, I don't think I did the right thing, but, but the loneliness and the abandonment that we imagine that it's now up to us to fix this. See, from the beginning, we realize that's not true, that God comes walking into those places where we find ourselves, even when we've made horrible decisions. And God, in only the way that God can do, finds ways to be merciful and compassionate to us there. If you're sitting here today and you're feeling the pain of that in your life, of just knowing that you've missed it somehow, you've messed it up, I want you to know that our God is able, he's willing, he's standing there with you in that place, and he longs to show compassion to you. As this narrative winds up, I want you to see one other thing. Uh, God speaking within himself says, The man has now become like one of us, speaking within his triune being. He's now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So in a sense, the serpent was right. If you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you become like God. You'll know good and evil. For God, God can know good and evil and not be overwhelmed by it. We are not so capable of that. We've asked for something that's beyond our ability to manage. And so God says he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So how many trees are there in the middle of the garden? Two. And we spent a lot of time looking at the tree uh, of knowledge of good and evil and what that did But right next to it all along has been this other tree, the tree of life. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always imagined that the tree of life was this, uh, you know, this, this magical tree where if you took fruit from the tree of life and you ate it, you would instantly become immortal. Anyone else kind of think of it that way? Yeah, I mean, that's how I've always thought of it, that, you know, if they reach out their hand and they eat this fruit, they'll become immortal and they'll, they'll then live forever. And, and yet this week I've been forced to think about this a little bit differently um, perhaps this tree of life that sat there in the middle of the garden that wasn't like a in case of emergency break glass kind of situation, um, maybe that was a tree that Adam and Eve had already eaten from repeatedly in order to live forever. Maybe that tree was not a one-time deal that would fundamentally change them, and maybe Adam and Eve didn't already possess immortality inside of themselves themselves, but maybe that tree was kind of like a fountain of youth. Maybe that tree was like Rapunzel's golden hair and the flower gleam and glow song. You know the song, Don't Make Me Sing It. Um, We just watched Tangled at our house this week, so it's fresh on my mind. Um, Maybe it's this thing that was that was something that they, yeah, there were other trees they could eat from, and those things would give them food and nourishment, but maybe this tree was a tree that they would go to regularly, and they would eat of it, and it was an ongoing reminder of their dependency on God, that they weren't immortal in and of themselves, but they were immortal as long as they lived dependent on God, and and they would go, and they they would remind themselves of their dependency on God, and they would remind themselves of his goodness to them. As their creator, the one who made them, the one who provided everything that they needed. And and they would repeatedly come to eat from the tree and live. And as long as they did that, they'd never age, they'd never die. See, whatever the case, now God says, you're not allowed to eat from the tree anymore. And he banishes them from the garden, which begins our pursuit of trying to find a way to live forever in some other way to attain to life forever. But the question we have to stop and ask ourselves, I think, is this, that that life forever, it's a good thing, yeah? But life forever, do we really want that here? And do we really want that like this? 
See, there's no question there are moments when life is beautiful, when life is good, when, when, when you're experiencing a moment and you just want it to last forever because it's so rich and you're ex- experiencing just the fullness of life. And in fact, God tells us in all circumstances to look for what is good and beautiful and noble, to dwell on the good things, to give thanks for the good things. There's no question that there are moments where life is, is so beautiful, where it's so good, where you can experience the blessing of God, yes, even here in this fallen world that we're living in. But then there are the other times. There are those other moments when life is filled with pain and loss, tragedy and heartache, heartbreak. And God in his mercy, seeing all that would come of this fateful decision, in his mercy, not in punishment, says, you can't live here in the garden. You cannot reach out your hand and keep eating from this tree and live forever. You can't live forever, not here, not like this. But again, far from punishing, this God who comes and finds us even when we're outside of the places he wants us to be, when we've made decisions that are disastrous, this God who comes with mercy and compassion, even in that moment as God is expelling Adam and Eve out of the garden saying, you cannot eat from this tree, you're not allowed to live forever, not like this, I I don't want this for you, I want more for you. In that very moment, he was also opening a door. A doorway for us to live forever through a different means. Another place we could go to eat and live. See, this God who comes and finds us wherever we are and shows us grace and mercy in the fullness of time walked onto our planet in flesh in the person of his son, Jesus. And Jesus, one day while he was teaching people, made so clear what he was here to do. He said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors, back in the wilderness when they left Egypt, God provided for them manna in the wilderness. Every day it was a special food that God gave them so they could survive. There wasn't food in the wilderness. And so God showered down this manna from heaven. They could eat it day by day. It was a daily bread that that they were given. Jesus says, your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here, here, Jesus says, is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. See, Jesus says why he came into the world. He came to be that new tree of life, the bread of life, where again, we can go regularly, not one and done, but regularly where we can go and commune with him and we can find life forever. That's why he came. That's why he gave his life so that we could live forever by daily going and and proclaiming our dependency and our need for him, reminding of ourselves, reminding ourselves of his goodness. That that if we do that, we can live forever. Now, when we talk about living forever, um, so often in the church, I, I think we think about the forever part. And we say, yeah, I, I know Jesus came and he, and he gave his life. And if I believe in him, I get to go to heaven someday. And that's true. It's, it's bigger than that though. Jesus, I mean, this is why we don't have to get all swept up in being a, a talking head on a coffee table someday. God wants more for us than that. See, God's end plan, the end game for us is not just that we'd be spirits in heaven, it's that we would be a recreated body and soul, a a new heaven and a new earth where everything is made right and everything is made whole. That's waiting for us in forever. But even still, what Jesus came into the world to offer us is not just a ticket to some 
existence forever. He also came to show us how to truly live. It's not just the forever part, it's the living part too. And I think most of us, because we've only known life outside of the garden here like this, I think in our, in, in our natural knowledge, we, we barely even know what it is to really live. I'm talking about a life without pain, without suffering, without guilt and shame, without toil and striving and feeling like the weight of the world is on your shoulders because in a way it is. Feeling like it's all up to you to provide for yourself and to make a name for yourself. And and Jesus invites us into something different. He invites us into a new Eden with him where we can experience provision and protection, where it's not all on us, where we do not have to carry the weight of our existence on our shoulders, where it's not up to us to provide for ourselves. We're allowed just to be and to be loved and to be seen and known. And to experience not an oppressive dependency, but the joy of being dependent on someone who is good and loving and is looking out for us. In other words, Jesus came into the world to invite us into what life was meant to be from the beginning. And I want you to know that that part of this journey is not just getting right with Jesus so that someday you can live forever, but a major part of this journey, and I think so often we miss it, is allowing Jesus to teach us now what it means to really live. It's, It's about going to him regularly and reminding of ourselves, reminding ourselves of our dependence on him and of his incredible goodness. It is communing with him so that we can really know what it is to live in preparation for forever. And I wanna know today, do you know Jesus in that way? I want so badly for you to know him like that. I want to know him more like that. In fact, right now, I wanna pray that we would all come into a deeper um, knowledge and relationship of Jesus in this way. Pray with me, Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for wanting more for us than life forever here, like this. God, I thank you for the moments in our lives where you fill them with beauty and you show yourself to be good even in the middle of this broken world, even in the middle of our brokenness and our bad decisions and the evil that exists around us. Thank you for providing us moments of respite where we can find joy and delight, where we can can experience goodness here. But Father, I thank you that you want more for us than life forever here, that our hope is bigger than just enduring here. God, thanks for the forever that you have laid up for us that is so much richer than anything we can imagine. Thank you for the promise of wholeness within our created being, not just a consciousness, but a body that's recreated and whole with a mind and a spirit in relationship with you and each other that is waiting for us someday. But God, most of all today, I thank you for this invitation. I thank you for this invitation to come to Jesus, this new tree of life, the bread of life, to eat, to commune, and to live. Father, I'm thankful for the promise of what that means for us now. And so, Father, I pray that for all of us here today, no matter how we know Jesus, if we know Jesus at all, that today we might understand that you're here with this invitation to eat and live, to truly live, to begin to experience life a new way. Father, that all of us here today would take hold of that fruit, that bread, and that through Jesus, 
we would find forgiveness and protection. We'd find shelter. We'd find provision apart from our own striving, that we'd find belonging and love, that we'd find worthiness and relationship. Father, I pray that all of us today would taste and see just a foretaste, an experience of foretaste of the great things that you have for us forever in Jesus. Amen.